Today, I'm going to talk about the eucalyptus tree. This is a very common tree here in Australia, where it's also sometimes called the gum tree. First, I'm going to talk about why it's important. Then, I'm going to describe some problems it faces at present. Right. Well, the eucalyptus tree is an important tree for lots of reasons. For example. It gives shelter to creatures like birds and bats, and these and other species also depend on it for food, particularly the nectar from its flowers. So it supports biodiversity. It's useful to us humans too because we can kill germs with a disinfectant made from oil extracted from eucalyptus leaves. The eucalyptus grows all over Australia, and the trees can live for up to four hundred years. So it's alarming that all across the country numbers of eucalyptus are falling because the trees are dying off prematurely. So what are the reasons for this? One possible reason is disease. As far back as the nineteen seventies. The tree started getting a disease called Mundula yellows. The tree's leaves would gradually turn yellow, then the tree would die. It wasn't until 2004 that they found the cause of the problem was lime or calcium hydroxide, to give it its proper chemical name, which was being used in the construction of roads. The lime was being washed away into the ground and affecting the roots of the eucalyptus trees nearby. What it was doing was preventing the trees from sucking up the iron they needed for healthy growth. When this was injected back into the affected trees, they immediately recovered. But this problem only affected a relatively small number of trees. By two thousand. Huge numbers of eucalyptus were dying along Australia's east coast of a disease known as Bell Minor-associated dieback. The Bell Minor is a bird, and the disease seems to be common where there are high populations of Bell Miners. Again, it's the leaves of the trees that are affected. What happens is that insects settle on the leaves and eat their way round them. Destroying them as they go, and at the same time they secrete a solution which has sugar in it. The bell miner birds really like this solution, and in order to get as much as possible, they keep away other creatures that might try to get it. So these birds and insects flourish at the expense of other species, and eventually so much damage is done to the leaves that the tree dies. But experts say that trees can start looking sick before any sign of bell miner associated dieback, so it looks as if the problem might have another explanation. One possibility is that it's to do with the huge bushfires that we have in Australia. A theory proposed over forty years ago by ecologist William Jackson. Is that the frequency of bushfires in a particular region affects the type of vegetation that grows there? If there are very frequent bushfires in a region, this encourages grass to grow afterwards. While if the bushfires are rather less frequent, this results in the growth of eucalyptus forests. So why is this? Why do fairly frequent bushfires? Actually, support the growth of eucalyptus. Well, one reason is that the fire stops the growth of other species, which would consume water needed by eucalyptus trees. And there's another reason: if these other quick-growing species of bushes and plants are allowed to proliferate, they harm the eucalyptus in another way by affecting the composition of the soil. And removing nutrients from it, so some bushfires are actually essential for the eucalyptus to survive, as long as they are not too frequent. 
In fact, there's evidence that Australia's indigenous people practiced regular burning of bushland for thousands of years before the arrival of the Europeans. But since Europeans arrived on the continent, the number of bushfires has been strictly controlled. Now scientists believe that this reduced frequency of bushfires to low levels has led to what's known as dry rainforest, which seems an odd name as usually we associate tropical rainforest with wet conditions. And what's special about this type of rainforest? Well, unlike tropical rainforest, which is a rich ecosystem. This type of ecosystem is usually a simple one. It has very thick, dense vegetation, but not much variety of species. The vegetation provides lots of shade, so one species that does find it ideal is the bell miner bird, which builds its nests in the undergrowth there. But again, that's not helpful for the eucalyptus tree. Good morning. You're through to the tourist information office. Tim speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. Could you give me some information about next month's festival, please? My family and I will be staying in the town that week. Of course. Well, it starts with a concert on the afternoon of the seventeenth. Oh, I heard about that. The orchestra and singers come from the USA, don't they? They're from Canada. They're very popular over there. They're going to perform a number of well-known pieces that will appeal to children as well as adults. That sounds good. My whole family are interested in music. The next day, the eighteenth, there's a performance by a ballet company called Eustatis. Sorry. The name is spelt E U S T A T I S. They appeared in last year's festival and went down very well. Again, their program is designed for all ages. Good. I expect we'll go to that. I hope there's going to be a play during the festival, a comedy, ideally. You're in luck. On the nineteenth and twentieth, a local amateur group are performing one written by a member of the group. It's called Jemima. That'll be on in the town hall. They've already performed it two or three times. I haven't seen it myself. But the review in the local paper was very good. And is it suitable for children? Yes, in fact, it's aimed more at children than at adults. So both performances are in the afternoon. And what about dance? Will there be any performances? Yes, also on the twentieth, but in the evening. A professional company is putting on a show of modern pieces with electronic music by young composers. Uh huh. The show is about how people communicate or fail to communicate with each other, so it's got the rather strange name, chat. I suppose that's because that's something we do both face to face and online. That's right. Now there are also some workshops and other activities. They'll all take place at least once every day, so everyone who wants to take part will have a chance. Good. We're particularly interested in cookery. You don't happen to have a cookery workshop, do you? We certainly do. It's going to focus on how to make food part of a healthy lifestyle, and it'll show that even sweet things like cakes can contain much less sugar than they usually do. Hmm, that might be worth going to. We're trying to encourage our children to cook. Another workshop is just for children. And that's on creating posters to reflect the history of the town. The aim is to make children aware of how both the town and people's lives have changed over the centuries. The results will be exhibited in the community centre. Then the other workshop is in toy making, and that's for adults only. Oh, why is that? Because it involves carpentry. Participants will be making toys out of wood, so there'll be a lot of sharp chisels and other tools around.、Mm. 
It makes sense to keep children away from it. Exactly. Now let me tell you about some of the outdoor activities. They'll be supervised wild swimming. Wild swimming? What's that? It just means swimming in natural waters, rather than a swimming pool. Oh, okay. In a lake, for instance. Yes, there's a beautiful one just outside the town, and that'll be the venue for the swimming. There'll be lifeguards on duty, so it's suitable for all ages. And finally, there'll be a walk in some nearby woods every day. The leader is an expert on insects. He'll show some that live in the woods and how important they are for the environment. So there are going to be all sorts of different things to do during the festival. There certainly are. If you'd like to read about how the preparations for the festival are going, the festival organizer is keeping a blog. Just search online for the festival website, and you'll find it. Well, thank you very much for all the information. You're welcome. Goodbye. Goodbye. I'm very pleased to welcome this evening's guest speaker, Mark Logan, who's going to tell us about the recent transformation of Minster Park. Over to you, Mark. Thank you. I'm sure you're all familiar with Minster Park. It's been a feature of the city for well over a century, and has been the responsibility of the city council for most of that time. What perhaps isn't so well known. Is the origin of the park. Unlike many public parks that started in private ownership, as the garden of a large house, for instance, Minster was some wasteland, which people living nearby started planting with flowers in 1892. It was unclear who actually owned the land, and this wasn't settled until 20 years later. When the council took possession of it, you may have noticed the statue near one of the entrances. It's of Diane Gosforth, who played a key role in the history of the park. Once the council had become the legal owner, it planned to sell the land for housing. Many local people wanted it to remain a place that everyone could go to, to enjoy the fresh air and natural environment. Remember. The park is in a densely populated residential area. Diane Gosforth was one of those people, and she organised petitions and demonstrations, which eventually made the council change its mind about the future of the land. Soon after this, the First World War broke out in 1914, and most of the park was dug up and planted with vegetables. Which were sold locally. At one stage, the army considered taking it over for troop exercises, and got as far as contacting the city council. Then decided the park was too small to be of use. There were occasional public meetings during the war, in an area that had been retained as grass. After the war. The park was turned back more or less to how it had been before 1914, and continued almost unchanged until recently. Plans for transforming it were drawn up at various times, most recently in 2013, though they were revised in 2015, before any work had started. The changes finally got going in 2016. And were finished on schedule last year. Okay, let me tell you about some of the changes that have been made and some things that have been retained. If you look at this map, you'll see the familiar outline of the park, with the river forming the northern boundary, and a gate in each of the other three walls. The statue of Diane Gosforth has been moved. It used to be close to the south gate, but it's now immediately to the north of the lily pond, almost in the centre of the park, which makes it much more visible. There's a new area of wooden sculptures, 
which are on the river bank where the path from the east gate makes a sharp bend. There are two areas that are particularly intended for children. The playground has been enlarged and improved, and that's between the river and the path that leads from the pond to the river. Then there's a new maze, a circular series of paths separated by low hedges. That's near the west gate. You go north from there towards the river and then turn left to reach it. There have been tennis courts in the park for many years and they've been doubled from four to eight. They're still in the southwest corner of the park where there's a right angle bend in the path. Something else I'd like to mention is the new fitness area. This is right next to the lily pond on the same side as the west gate. Now, as you're all gardeners, I'm sure you'll like to hear about the plants that have been chosen for the park.